So, uh, hello everybody. For those who don't know who I am, um, I'm Rob Edwards from ISBE. And a very, very warm welcome to today's webinar, which will run for an hour. Um, I'm about to pass over to uh, Dr. Natalia Vershanina, who's going to introduce our speakers today. Um, if you have any questions while the, pres the presenters are talking, um, or if you have any sort of queries, then you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which you'll see. Um, and you can also use the chat function as well, and you'll be able to see that you can either send messages to the speakers themselves, to all speakers, or to me it is beep. Um, so if you're having any problems or anything, then just uh, drop me a line through the chat function. Okay. So um, by default, everybody's mics are turned off at the moment in terms of the attendees. So if you want to, uh, to ask a question, then you can use the raise hand button as well. Um, and uh, then we can obviously do the questions. Um, so the speakers are going to keep to 10 minutes each for their presentations, and there'll be a quick question and answer at the end of each presentation, and then at the end we'll have a, a broader Q&A. Okay, so again, thank you very much on behalf of Visby for joining us today, and I will stop sharing my screen and pass you over to Natalia. Okay, thank you, Rob. I think uh, we're very excited on behalf of the Dundon Enterprise Network uh, of ISB to have you all attend and to kind of listen in and hopefully comment and contribute to this uh, webinar. And the concept of intersectionality that will be discussed, is, uh, as you know, has been introduced by um, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw to us in 1989 and since then has become a very popular and you know kind of fast and uh, has traveled quite far in terms of developing our theory and methodology in today's seminar we have three you know three incredible speakers um, uh, in their role and right researchers in of intersectionality as well as women of color who will hopefully Enable, enable us to better understand this concept. We're going to start with uh, Dr. Angela martinez Dai, our own uh, you know, part of GenSig, an incredible force to be reckoned with, and she's going to introduce the theor theoretical ideas around intersectionality. The second speaker, Jennifer Agwinobi, will look at um, relationships between um, intersectionality, entrepreneurship and well-being, which she is examining in, in her PhD at this point in time. And to sum it up and to kind of to give us a bit more ideas, a few more ideas to kind of how, how intersectionality fits in, fits in with an organizational setting. And what do we do with this further? Uh, we'll have uh, insights from uh, Dr. Jenny Rodriguez. So, Angela, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Natalia and Rob, for helping us set this up and to have all of these attendees in, in cyberspace is one of the most exciting things for me, um, especially as a researcher of, of the digital economy and for people who are interested in how folks can virtually, this is, is pretty special. Um, so I am Angela Martinez D. Um, I'm speaking today, uh, I'd like to give you a potted history of intersectionality um, as I've come to understand it, of course, my version of the history might be different than another person's version of the history, but I'll do my best to, to, uh, to stay true to what I see as uh, intersectionality's roots. Um, and then look a little bit uh, at how the theory could be used in something like uh, my field, which is entrepreneurship studies. And then I'm gonna sum up with a, a, a little glimpse into how intersectionality has been implemented in uh, activist settings. So intersectionality and practice. So that is the... I'm going to set up the slides for you now. So, so just bear with me. Okay, that should be working. Right. And I'm setting my timer also to keep myself honest. So, um, I'm from Loughborough University, London. Uh, I'm a lecturer in entrepreneurship there. Um, I'm also a member of the ISB Gender and Enterprise Network, um, have in the past been responsible for uh, marketing and communications, um, and really excited to be presenting also at our, our forthcoming uh, seminar, uh, Think Space, that'll be happening in Newcastle next week. So shout out to those of you who will be there with us. Um, starting off with the key question, I think the question of the, of the afternoon, 
what is intersectionality? Is it a theory? Is it a construct? Is it a set of concepts? Um, let's just start by beginning with the fact that intersectionality is a critique. Intersectionality is a critique of the way in which people at particular neglected uh, areas of, of uh, insight have not been addressed by uh, the, the analysis of people looking at categories of oppression. Um, at particular points of intersection is, is the, the phraseology that tends to be used. Um, and historically, this what the concept emerged from black feminism in the US because black women were excluded from analyses of oppression that had to do with race, um, which tended to look primarily at black men and that had to do with women, which tended to look primarily at white women. So Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 articulated intersectionality um, with this term that has had you know, so much force um, and, and so much influence in the field of feminist studies and beyond. Um, but it is a notion that was really articulated um, centuries before. Um, and it came from the thinking of formerly enslaved Black American women, such as Sojourner Truth, for example, um, whose famous phrase, Ain't I a Woman, was actually the title of a Bell Hooks, uh, Bell Hooks first book in 1989. So when you say intersectionality, what you are referring to is this entire history of pointing out people at neglected points of intersection, uh, particularly groups of people who would otherwise be ignored. Um, but today we see it more as a notion that multiple social categories affect people simultaneously and in concert. So you can see that there's already a difference between what the origin of the theory was and how we use it today. Um, currently, you can consider intersectionality to be a spectrum of both theoretical and methodological approaches. So with different ontologies, different epistemologies, it's, it's somehow very, uh, a very broad church. Um, but those uh, approaches are used to understand complex relational experiences of both oppression and privilege. So it's not a, a one-way concept that says, well, something is intersectional, it must be looking only at oppression. Really, intersectionality today understands that people at different social locations, different locations and social hierarchies experience both oppression and privilege as a result of multiple social categories working at the same time. Um, this concept has uh, been taken forward in different ways. Um, one of the ways that, that I've liked to, um, uh, uh, one of the, the concepts that I think that kind of builds on intersectionality that I've used in my own work is the notion of positionality, which is really pointing to those positions within social hierarchies that people occupy um, and looking at how those positions are changeable over space and time. So um, my experience as a Filipina American woman in the US, um, I haven't changed who I am. So my identity technically hasn't changed, but as I move here to the UK, um, the force of those categories changes. Um, and I experience different nuances of privilege and oppression because I'm in a different uh, context. So I've moved locations um, and I've moved space and time. So things affect me differently. Um, so I think this, this very much builds on the original intersectional concepts, um, but is uh, a, a way that we can start to apprehend it um, a little bit more practically as it applies to, to various individuals and lived experiences. Um, I assume that many of the folks who are listening um, would be interested in feminist studies or gender studies because you know they've been attracted by this gender and enterprise webinar. So I'm moving now to say, well, why is looking at sex or gender not enough? Um, and really the early intersectional scholars pointed out that when you look only at sex and gender, you lose a lot of nuance, you lose a lot of complexity. So it is an important category to consider, but it's not the only one. Um, and is one of many categories used to structure society. So it has to be taken in conjunction with other markers. Um, the, um, the, the term that we use to refer to feminist theory that looks only at gender is single access thinking. Um, and we, we say that single access thinking is often exclusionary and sometimes can be essentialist um, in that it tends to um, assume that 
all people in a particular category, in this case, probably all women, are alike and that their experiences are alike. And uh, we know because intersectionality helps us to see uh, differences amongst groups of women that that is not exactly the case. Um, so if we ignore intersectionality, if we say, well, you know, I can just look at this group of women or this group of men and, and analyze their femininities and analyze their masculinities without taking into account other aspects of their identity, it means we ignore how gender differences could be shaped by other forms of marginalization happening at the same time. Um, I have some references that I've scattered in here just, you know, as I said, potted history. So um, I've, I've picked and, and chosen, um, but this one by Pierce um, is an analysis of uh, a Phoebe Swan in the UK. And Pierce points out that within uh, even feminized academic disciplines, you have an underrepresentation of women of color, disabled women, um, and queer women as well. So if you are saying, well, you know, women are marginalized in the academy, you also can, can add on to that, that there is further, further marginalization as a result of other categories of oppression. Um, intersectionality has had a, an interesting relationship, shall we say, with feminist theory. Um, it emerged in a time of third wave feminism that was heavily influenced by post-structuralism. Um, and for any of you philosophers of science out there, people who are interested in, in post-structuralism, you'll understand, you know, the, the push of post-structuralism is that there is no one essential truth. Um, so it's very critical of essentialism, very critical, critical of reification. However, early intersectional thinking was structuralist. So Patricia Hill Collins and particularly Angela Davis, they were working from a Marxist feminist framework. So um, as I said, it, it, you know, has this kind of really interesting, um, you know, uh, duality in, in its, uh, maybe, maybe, it's well, maybe we don't like binaries, but, but there is some kind of duality in, in that it, in, it's influenced by post-structuralism, but also by structuralism. Um, and over time, due to the usefulness of intersectionality, people could start to see how other categories were at play um, in their analyses. And so because it was so conceptually useful, they, these other categories got added over time. So it was more than just the kind of American holy trinity of race, sex and gender, or excuse me, race, gender, and class. Um, but then it started to include things like ethnicity, um, LGBTQ, queer studies, disability studies, uh, age, amongst others. So it felt like there was a point at which I'm sure it felt like uh, intersectionality could be anything, could account for any combination of social categories at play. Um, and this, what, uh, what we call this mainstreaming of intersectionality, the way it moved from being really just about black women at a neglected point of, inter point of intersection to moving to this space where it could be used to articulate almost any kind of um, confluence of social forces meant that race and black women often now get erased from their own homegrown theory. So for me, if your intersectionality doesn't look at black women, doesn't attend to what black women are experiencing, for me, it's not intersectionality and for a lot of uh, other intersectional scholars as well. Um, you, ha you have to attend to race. Um, if you're not studying black women, at least attend to race. There, there's just, you know, otherwise it, it, it's, lost, it's lost one of its key anchors. Um, but uh, that said, one of the most beautiful things that I've seen um, in the past, I would say, I don't know, 10, 10 years or so, is the amount of intersectional thinking that has uh, emerged in digital feminism that has left the bounds of the academy and it's just all over Twitter, all over Instagram. It's just, it's really, really beautiful to see people operating in these ways that are, that are highly intersectional and that it's not just a, um, an echoing of intersectional thinking from the academy, but it's actually being pushed forward in digital feminist spaces. People are actually doing the thinking, doing the articulation um, that, that is taking intersectionality to the cutting edge. And that's, that's where I think the, the, the hottest intersectional work is happening right now. Um, I am almost near my 10 minutes, so I am going to try to pick it up. Um, some key principles that I think are useful for doing intersectionality research is remembering that there are lots of categorical differences operating at the same time. They are uh, durable, they last over time, but they're also changeable, and sometimes they're contradictory. That's what makes it so complex. Um, intersectionality research also needs to attend to power 
privilege, oppression, and inequality. If it doesn't account for these things, it's not intersectional. And then lastly, it needs to look at the structural as well as the individual, the systemic as well as the agential. It has this multi-level approach. It's really, really important. What does intersectionality do for us? It reveals so much theoretically. It shows us that categorical groups are actually heterogeneous. It show us those, shows us those nuanced experiences of privilege and oppression. And importantly, it makes whiteness visible. Um, empirically, just these are just some key examples. Intersectional work is amazing because it shows us things that we wouldn't have seen before. Um, I'm not going to go over these, but you can check out the, the sources if you want. Um, just be aware that when you think intersectionally, you have new conclusions that you wouldn't have been able to accomplish before. Um, in entrepreneurship studies, um, we take uh, power, privilege, and entrepreneurial resources to be unequally distributed from an intersectional point of view. We assume that social context shapes the daily experiences of entrepreneurs, but if we, we can we can assume that we know then that intersectionality is shaping those social contexts. So we're looking for how it is working in their entrepreneurial experiences. Um, I really want to talk to you about these these um, social movements, but I will I will just have to ask you to look at them on your own because I've run out of time. But the Goldsmiths anti-racist student occupation. Please check out their manifesto. They're in occupation now. They've been in occupation for over fifty days um, at Deptford Town Hall, trying to get their university to. Uh, to be less racist. And it is a very uh, uh, black Muslim uh, woman led or, uh, uh, intervention and it's fully intersectional and it's beautiful. Um, the other one is the decolonizing alliance. Um, I think we'll just leave that for, for a forthcoming paper. Um, what do you say about that? Uh, so some selected references and that is my time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Angela. It's wonderful. Um, are we are we going to have a look at were there any questions sent, Rob, from uh, the participants so far? Let me have a look. Um, no, nothing so far. So if if, uh, if there are any questions, could you please uh, share them with with us? But in the meantime, I'd like to maybe whilst uh, you know we're waiting for a few questions to come, Angela, could, could you talk a little bit uh, to us? You've given us the, the three key principles, and obviously um, the last one, the systemic, the systemic one, is the one that you know I, I'd like. To could you give us a little bit more insight on uh, kind of methodologically how do we tackle this? What what possibly can we do? And, uh, um, yes, so Jennifer and I, uh, Jennifer will be speaking next. Uh, we have a paper that's just come out in uh, International Journal of Entrepreneurial Behavior and Research, which is a methodological paper on intersectionality and uh, multi-method approaches. Um, and we think that t adopting both quantitative and qualitative methods is the only way that we're going to get these multi-level analyses. And we're, we're not assuming that every researcher um, has the desire or to, to, to do both um, you know, uh, mixed methods approaches, but that it is the combination of these that is going to help to serve um, our multi-level analyses. So uh, qualitative researchers should be looking at the outcomes of quantitative research. Quantitative researchers should be looking at the outcomes of qualitative research. Um, so with the, the quantitative research, we can see structural patterns. With the qualitative research, we can see what's happening at the individual level. Okay. Uh, I think your microphone might be muted, Natalia. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have a question from John Kitching. Yeah, uh, hi. hi, John. Can you speak to us? Bear with me. Where have you gone, John? Okay, I'll just uh, put John's microphone off. Okay, John, if you turn your microphone on, you should be able to talk. If we're having a little bit of trouble, we can save the question to the end as well. We are going to have another Q and A. Yes, that's true. Yeah. 
Hello. Hello. Hey, Hi. Joe. Hello. Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. I don't know why it's muted. Oh, good. Um, I just wondered where. Um, a question for Angela. I just wondered where socio-economic class might fit into all uh, the discussions about intersectionality. Socio-economic uh, class is essential to the discussions of intersectionality. And it's absolutely at the core of the work that Black feminists did in the 80s and it continues to be at the core of, of intersectional work today. Okay. Yeah. When you talk about power, privilege, oppression, and inequality, like classes is, is there. It's, it's, if you're not accounting for the effects of class and it's, it impacts it on, uh, for example, I, I'll talk about entrepreneurship stuff because that, that's what I know. Educational background, right? Uh, social capital, uh, employment history, how high you are able to, to uh, reach in your employment history and what that has uh, allowed you to do in terms of entrepreneurial resources. I mean, all of those are, are fully connected to social class, but not divorced from race and gender. Mm. You, have to, you have to kind of bring this kind of triadic analysis in. It um, seems to it seems to be often missing from studies of uh, entrepreneurship. Um, we, well, we think we know a lot about gender. We think we know a, a lot about color or race, um, but kind of class seems to get left a little. Um, and there's it, you know, harder because it's not as obviously uh, visible, right? It's sure. a harder to to. To discuss number one with your with your participants, it's kind of hard to, to get them to open up about that or to ask the right questions. I mean, people just have to practice, right? We all have to practice. How do we get folks to reveal what pieces of their identity, excuse me, of their experiences come from the class-based identity um, and histories? But I, I certainly attempt to do it as much as I can in, in my research and. I think that there is more of a movement now to, to looking at gender and class in particular. I think um, uh, Jen has done some stuff on that recently, but I would also say, you know, now we can't lose out race. Um, so th this, is, this is the key area of debate for intersectionality, is which categories are central and which are um, more, more peripheral. And you know, I think it's a, a topic for, for much future uh, discussion, but I, I would 100% say, class analyses are embedded in intersectional thinking fully. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. We have one more question from Margot, um, Margot Enthoven. Enthoven, yes. Um, so let me just read, read through this. Some of the work of, of, on intersectionality also includes animals as oppressed group. So what do you think about this and how do you see this in the light of entrepreneurship? Mm. Where are the black women? Mm. Where are the black women? Uh, intersectionality is a theory that was by and for black women. If your intersectional analysis is, is excluding black women, then maybe maybe you need a different theory. Um, animals are oppressed groups, um, mm. but they, they're not subject to the exact same kinds of social categories that humans are. Um, there are probably some things that we can learn about the of uh, global majority women and animals that we don't have here in the West. But I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit on a tangent here, but I think there's some possibilities. My, my real question is, if, there, if, if you're missing out attention to the women of color and the black women who started this theory, you know, is this the right theory for you? Thank you. Rob, shall we move on to the next, or is there another question? Um, no, let me have a look. There's a comment on a paper by Classless Entrepreneurship Education, Taya Karedi. Taya Karedi, yes. Uh, yeah, of Social Origins Predict Individual Entrepreneurial Orientation. It actually is an interesting, um, I'm not familiar with that paper in particular because my field is not entrepreneurship, I, I have to say, but the issue of class has been problematized because people are afraid to speak about class, especially because class relies on subjective, <clears throat> either self perceptions of where do I sit in the class system or how others position me in the class system. And I think that is one of the problems that we don't talk about class because we assume that either we are aspiring 
middle class or proudly working class, but then some people are proudly working class, living middle class lifestyles. And so it's complicated, I think, intersectionally to map that out. Also because um, I think there's an issue in terms of thinking about what it means to claim intersectional disadvantage if you are a rich person, mm. for example. So, yeah. in the, and I think that should be an issue for those who are researching entrepreneurship, <laughs> most of you, mm. uh, because the reality is that at some level, entrepreneurs, if they're successful, start entering a different class. Mm -hmm. And to what extent can we claim that they may have uh, certain forms of disadvantage? If, and, and that doesn't preclude that they will, but I think it's difficult to theorize that because people themselves might see, might see that they have overcome particular barriers in their social status. So I, that's just a thought, <laughs> but I think it's interesting that perhaps um, in certain occupations, we need to discuss class more critically and for mm -hmm. it to stop being a taboo subject. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. totally agree. Uh, sorry to interrupt, we're getting quite a few questions coming in now. So I think what we might do is to move on to the next presentation and then we'll cover all the questions. <laughs> yeah, Jennifer, Jennifer, we're over to you now. Hi everyone, so my name is Jennifer Albanova. I'm just going to share my screen right now so um, you can see. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yeah. So my page PhD is on entrepreneurship and well-being in the digital economy with intersectionality as a vertical lens. So, um, coincidentally on that topic of class, which I can just quickly um, cover a bit. So I'm doing mixed methods. I actually did arts about class and in my online survey and in my interviews. And as mentioned from Danny and Angela, it's one of those, firstly, it, it tends to be quite subjective. There are different ways of measuring it with education but for the most part it is subjective so yeah it's really important to ask those questions and that point that Jenny made is important too from the transition when it comes to money and going into a different class like how does that all interplay but what I found what I'll discuss a bit later is that um, a lot of people a lot of startups fell and a lot of people that are trying to become entrepreneurs or are entrepreneurs they may also have second jobs and it is quite difficult in that sense but they still see themselves in that class where in a lower class where they may be struggling or they're not at where they would like to be compared to their counterparts but i'll go on to that soon so in regards to well-being so there's different definitions for well-being in um and in academia there's a lot of different measures too but there's not one size fits all approach for well-being, especially when intersectionality is involved. But according to the World Health Organization, um, health it is defined as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. And it was the concept of well-being in intersectionality that was really interesting to me, especially when it came to these entrepreneurs who are starting out or trying to um, launch their businesses that maybe don't have the same support as their counterparts because of class and because of race and because of gender and the combination of those all. And I know that there's a lot of, um, we've discussed it before, but focuses on like the barriers of gender, the barriers of race individually, but when put together, for example, black women, which you mentioned, there are these other barriers too that um, when you link in well-being, there's factors such as, which I've got a table here to show, there's things such as microaggressions, discriminations of the group that um, concern the combination, lack of lay, um, level playing field, sense of belonging, community, whitewashing. So if you can see in this table, the, um, the top part of it all shows what we typically may know of well-being and entrepreneurship in academia and in practice. So it's stuff like these words like uncertainty or utility or effect or stress, anxiety, it's still growing. However, when we consider intersectionality as a theoretical lens, there's certain aspects to well-being which wouldn't necessarily be covered in these initial sort of key words and phrases. So microaggressions in particular is one that is quite prominent. So that could, for example of microaggression, it could be something like this in, in general, things like 
but like where are you actually from you sound white you're pretty for a dark skin girl i didn't expect you to be a woman um there's no need to be aggressive kind of touch your hair so it could be these sort of comments but they accumulate over time for certain people and it, it and when you put an intersectionality for example black women look these are specific to black women but also um microaggressions can well by definition are subtle so then how do you cope with that we don't know how, what, what sometimes people don't even know how to name what they're going through because they just don't know how to discuss it it's just one of those things so i see that under well-being so in that sense these comments that accumulate can affect people's like self-esteem could affect their anxiety levels it could make them a bit depressed if, if they're in a situation where they're the only person of color, women of color for example and they get in these comments they don't have anyone else to relate to so this is how i link in and while being in intersectionality and, and, and in terms of entrepreneurship it's quite interesting because with digital entrepreneurs um angela ha has a paper on this where um whitewashing is quite is quite big in the sense that even in my interviews that i've done a lot of people have recognized that they've had to sometimes hide aspects of themselves such as their name or their pictures or or just in general a lot of things because they don't want to be disadvantaged and they want to have the same opportunity as others and they've recognized that they've had to do this for, for that reason because of oppression and for that reason there's a lot of invisible um they feel invisible at times or, or they feel like they can't necessarily be themselves because there's certain things that they can't change like their skin color so discrimination hurts ultimately discrimination hurts when it comes to um, and when you link in well-being with the intersectional, intersectional framing, we see that it's quite important to consider the well-being of these people. Otherwise, we're missing, we're missing, we're excluding people once again. For example, black women, as you mentioned, quite a lot. Because if we are just looking at gender issues, barriers as a female entrepreneur, or even barriers as, um, for example, a black entrepreneur. As um, was mentioned, the matrix of domination, it might be that the focus might be white women or black men, but again, it might exclude some people if we don't look at it more holistically. And there is um, the importance of context, like there is a stigma of mental health in certain marginalized communities. And well, as I mentioned before, it hurts, but what hurts? Like Ahmed, Tara Ahmed mentions the key, the importance of naming things. Like if we don't discuss these things or even research it, we don't know, we know things are there, that like people in question know it's there, but we don't know what exactly it is, like how it's affecting people. And that's when the um, question of methodology comes into play. And again, the key, the key is always attention to power and privilege. And that can be done with the matrix of domination too but it's, com it's complicated because that involves privilege and oppression which is really important to always consider like even me myself I'm a black female but I was born and brought up in the UK so I've got that privilege from being born and brought up here but the disadvantage and oppression of being black and female so it's really important to consider these things and that certain combinations leave individuals at a disadvantage compared to their counterparts um, We've mentioned the matrix of domination um, by Collins and this idea that we can we can make certain individuals feel invisible if we just focus on certain aspects of gender, race, class without the combination or just in, in general about the intersectionality and the roots of it all. And again, when it comes to well-being, one thing I've noticed a lot of my research so far is that an intentional constant comparison and reference point. So it is a fact that we do compare in regard to doing this research, it does it does require reference points in terms of comparison and saying this is advantage, just privilege and stuff. But even that in itself is quite interesting because that in itself, the constant comparison could be quite detrimental to the people in question too and comparison in general is, is linked to unhappiness so it is again it's complicated but there is scope to um, research this more and just look into how these things in, in affect people on an individual level and that intersectionality is more than just interaction effects in, in terms of quant. Um, so yeah Angela I mentioned that these things already but it's quite important for us to consider this 
that membership of multiple social categories affiliated with oppression can affect people's well-being, especially in a context that's highly stressful, like entrepreneurship, for example, because if someone has been marginalised, for example, in the labour market, then that can come with them when it comes to entrepreneurship. It could mean that they use entrepreneurship as a means to escape that oppression and discrimination. But essentially, digital entrepreneurship can help with that because they can choose to hide certain aspects of themselves. However, if there is a face-to-face -face meeting, for example, those issues that they may have had in the labour market could still be with them. So it's quite important to see how that interplays and comes together and the, just the whole the whole cycle and yeah so bringing in well-being so this is just the paper that Angelo mentioned earlier and yeah so essentially just these nuances when it comes to just in general in terms of the um my research nuances when it comes to well-being and it's sort of these things that we touch upon but um, in regards, for example, that table, when we explicitly say, okay, microaggressions exist in the labour market and it comes, and also in entrepreneurship, whether that's through having meetings or just in general, general comments, people might get networking events or sense of belonging and just not feeling like they're welcome or part of everyone else because of the, the uptake in entrepreneurship, for example, um, statistics. And... Um, discriminations and isms of the combinations of racism, sexism, um, classism even. So yeah, the, this is what um, this is what I'm researching and it's really important to me because I think that from doing so, even from people doing interviews and even just filling in the survey, the sense of awareness of them realizing that okay, some of them don't even think about it because it's just a thing about naming things once again. It's like they're aware it's there, but not even been able to discuss it with other people, for example, if they're in a situation where they're on their own, so entrepreneurship can be quite lonely. Um, that's the importance of like networks and social networks, but it can be quite lonely. So just trying to like, bring that narrative, like include the narratives of intersectionality and wellbeing as, the, um, as entrepreneurship and wellbeing grows in general in academia and in, in practice, people are more interested in it. So yeah, <laughs> thank you, I hope. You enjoyed my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Very, very interesting. So, so in, your, in your research, are you trying to examine ways in which uh, one could measure the, the potency of influence, variety of influences? You know, because, you know, it kind of um, reminded me, I wonder whether, you know, we've, we've had these discussions with John Kitching um, a few, few years back about, you know, how one can accumulate advantages if they start at advantageous position, the, you know, there is clearly uh, the alternative path. One can, you know, starting at a disadvantageous position with time, you ac accumulate variety of disadvantages. Mm. Um, and I wonder whether, you know, whether, are there any ways, so with, with your reading and also with the paper that you've, uh, you've recently published with Angela, uh, what, is, what are your suggestions on trying to measure how these work? You know, how do they actually influence in individual cases? Do we look at them as case by case? By case? Yeah. Uh, can we look at this as, you know, from the point of the group perspective? Is there a group kind of way of seeing yeah. it? Or, or is it really all specific to individual in so question? It's really interesting that um, what Angela mentioned earlier in terms of like, there are the essential, essential categories that we tend to look at, but even in terms of methodology, so like an online survey, a cross-sectional online survey, where it is just at one point in time, and then even an interview. So my mixed methods um, approach is in survey first and then interviews um, built to explain the results in the survey. So I do get to explore things a bit further. So in that sense, some of the people that filled in the survey are just people who I'm interviewing. So there is that time element to it. However, I do think in the future it, um, it might be quite beneficial to do more longitudinal things like once a month or diary studies or something that you can see things over time and sort of be able to recognise, okay, those transitions. As mentioned before, the class, like if as the business grows and even going into different classes, like how does that, like what effects do these, these things have? And that can definitely be again a, a mixture of methods or just one or the other but I do think it's beneficial to be able to 
build upon these things and and I think the time element could be really interesting for the future thing in terms of answering that question because you've been able to see over time okay this has potentially these advantages have accumulated or these or this isn't getting any better for example the oppression or even just self-awareness I think is a key thing that people are recognizing okay wow I didn't realize that but now I know let me maybe do something about it or let me see who I can speak to and then again that might affect the transitions too. A lot of the the methods issues are about asking the key questions I yeah. think um, there's a the, the work that I drew on for my PhD was Harriet Bradley's work uh, social class categories and um, she's broken it down into you know who occupies what types of occupations occup occupy which categories and then from there you can draw out questions that ask people to um, identify themselves and markers and, and, and uh, belonging to particular categories but you have to be a, a little bit creative and persistent yeah. to, to ask those those questions so some of the things that I've been asking are um, you know what generation uh, did you go to university what generation of uh, your family are you to go to university uh, for people who are entrepreneurs what was your job title at your last paid position um, I mean certain questions like this are, are indicators and then they help you get a sense of where these individuals are at you can ask those questions through uh, surveys so quantitatively or you can ask them in interview but it's about kind of having a, a, an arsenal for lack of a better word of questions that allow you to make some these conclusions about where people are located in terms of class. I feel like we're, we're speaking about this a lot, but because uh, race and gender are more easily identified, people want to know how do you, how do you bring class in? It's about asking the right questions. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Are there any other questions, Rob? Okay, so we've got a question from Annie, Annie Roos, who says, uh, being rather new to intersectionality, I wonder if you have an example of a go-to question I could ask of my material to begin doing an intersectionality analysis. So I guess it depends on what you're looking at, um, the topic area, for example. So in mine and Angela's paper, we've got some example questions there on how to go about arts and or the methods in general. So you can start there and just, I'll go back to it. But it also just depends on what you're looking at. So as Angela just mentioned, you might ask things in a, like you might lead up to things like, one of, for example, the questions in my survey, my interview asks uh, about stress, just sources of stress, and people tend to, without even mentioning gender or race in my question, people do tend to bring up these questions, these um, these issues. So sometimes it obviously it's not it's not um, a leading question, just something that's quite generic. But then you see what people identify as quite um, hurtful, like discrimination hurts, for example. So you you do see that you can ask the most generic questions, but then you will get people, it'll, it'll not even trigger, but it'll like get, get the answers from the participants because it's something that's been on their mind for a while. They haven't even maybe had the opportunity to talk about it. But it also just depends on what you're, you're studying. This paper is a good place to start because it has some guidelines. <laughs> good plug. Okay, can we move on to our last speaker? Okay. Last but not least. <laughs> Yes, Jenny, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Angela. I am opening my, can you see my slide? Great. Okay. Uh, basically, um, well, I, I don't know whether I need to introduce myself, but I, uh, I will. I am based at Alliance Manchester Business School. And I'm also a member of the Work and Equalities Institute, where, the, where my heart is actually sitting, I would say, more strongly. Um, and I have been doing work on intersectionality, and I think that for me at this point, um, th some of the questions are related to where we are now and what issues remain in our field. My slides are basically just, there's one slide, to be honest. Also because I, wa I was last, I thought, like, well, I'm not overwhelm hold on I'm struggling to get this as a presentation yes so basically the way I see this happening is well there are three things that we need to think about in relation to where we are now uh, and I speak about our field quite broadly 
I think our field is not just uh, organizations, but I think it's business and management more generally. And within that, I include, um, I could include entrepreneurship, I, and I think we should, but anything that um, addresses any of the disciplines that fall within business and management, I think this discussion is relevant too. And I think at this point, it is the case, I, I, I will draw a lot on what Angela was talking at the start because you introduced very well everything that uh, sets the ground for what I'm going to, in a, in a way, critique. Um, for me, the issue is that, yes, intersectionality is very popular to the point that it's a buzzword. And if you're not doing intersectionality work, you don't know where it's at. And that is good, but it's also problematic. On the one hand, we have taken a theory that was not designed to address all the problems that people feel oppress them. Having said that, I think the richness of intersectionality is that we have managed to appropriate parts of it and the intersectionality, the intersectionality purists out there will disagree, but we have to recognize that in business and management, we have lived in a gender neutral discussion and continue to live in a gender neutral discussion. We haven't even managed to mainstream gender. Are we going to actually say that we're going to move to mainstream intersectionality to address issues of race without them being a taboo, address issues of class and so on? We have not been successful at that. Discussions about class most of the time, and I go back to that question because I thought it was an interesting question, is those discussions are primarily in sociology, not in business and management. We are very happy to just move on with the capitalist ideology and get on with it. And we know that things happen, but we are not so critical of that necessarily. So I think that I organized my, my brief intervention in three areas, theory, methodology, and practice. And I think the first thing is, should we be talking about intersectional uh, intersectionality or should we be moving to develop our own framework in terms of organizational intersectionality? And at one point, and this is a question that, oh, it's a recurrent issue when people are talking about intersectionalities. Okay, should we be thinking about, we already have diversity management. Why should we worry about intersectionality when diversity management in effect addresses some of the needs that pertain to our field from the perspective of what organizations prioritize? So that, for me, is a fundamental question. I think, theoretically, uh, this is about understanding how we conceptualize intersectionality. Angela was saying uh, to, a, to the question about the animals, for example, like, where are the black women? I could ask the same question because I'm not a black woman. And I would also, I would also argue that one of the problems in, in discussing intersectionality as something that is uh, relevant to me as a worker in organizations and as a worker of color, I think it's different to be a black woman than being a woman of color. But it, and that brings the issue of how we understand in organizations, race, racialized uh, uh, structures, and, and all of that, which we, again, do not theorize sufficiently. And so in that respect, I think there's a tension between uh, what intersectionality gives us and what we are doing with it and the extent to which in using intersectionality, we're also in a way venturing into concepts that we have not necessarily thought about so carefully, but have embedded because they explain something. The question is whether the explanatory power that they have for a case, which was what started Kimberly Crenshaw's discussion, does apply in the same way in which we want to use it in our field, a field that legitimizes particular relationships and particular dynamics that happened under the veil of business as usual. The other issue in relation to theory, the first one is the issue of, of uh, conceptualization. Um, for me, it's the issue of spatial insularity. We cannot overlook the fact that when we talk about gender, when we talk about race, when we talk about class, when we talk about age, when we talk about disability, those are socially constructed terms. However, we have been using this in a westernized way. And to what extent are then our intersectional analysis doing or approaching that emancipatory aim that Kimberly Crenshaw actually, uh, I would say, dreamed about in her, in her critique 
of frameworks. And one of the things is that we are not interrogating the socially constructed nature of the terms to begin with. We simply assume, as Lisa Bollig at one point put it, like, well, it's mix, you know, add and mix, and that doesn't really give us the outcome. And in our case, we have not necessarily interrogated also that organizations have been very exclusive. If we go back to the idea, for example, Mira Yuval Davis talks about the oppression Olympics, we operate on that logic in organizations because the even minority groups, the ones that are more powerful in the workplace are majorities within the minorities. And so those, that creates an issue in terms of how we theorize this to understand the implications of saying we have an intersectional framework and it means the same for everyone, it doesn't because we have not defined what that is. Then there's the issue of taboo terminology in our field. I think issues, um, Angela mentioned oppression and there's also, uh, also Jennifer talked about uh, Patricia Hill Collins and, and, and this issue of the matrix of domination. And I'm, I'm wondering the extent to which terms like domination, terms like subordination and oppression are actually the terminology that we use in our discipline. And the extent to which that terminology is accepted to explain what happens uh, in organizations, what happens in business. Do we say, unless you're coming from a specific position, if you're an intersectional scholar, that will not be an alien terminology to use. But if you're engaging with other just for the sake of argument, strategic management people, are they going to refer to things in using this duality of domination, oppression? And also there's the other element, to what extent we engage with this issue of the uh, white supremacist ideology, which is central to what started this discussion about intersectionality. But I'll be honest, even being an intersectional scholar, I'm very careful to use that term in my daily life because I think it's very charged. And so in terms of how I articulate the theory, when I use it myself, I do feel that I'm quite cautious depending on what it is that I am talking about. And that for me is a limitation. I don't know if I don't, I don't necessarily uh, would say that it's a limitation for everyone, but I do think that it's an important limitation in terms of my ability to think that this theory has been developed in a way that is useful to explore all the problems that I see. And, and it's not because it should explore all of them, but considering that I am looking at issues trying to identify where are the dynamics that create inequality or that perpetuate it, I shouldn't feel that there's an issue engaging with these terms, but I feel that there is an issue. We still don't address even issues of race and discrimination because of the legal background that they have. Maybe I'm speaking specifically in the context of the UK because we have the protected characteristics and so on and so forth. Then there's the methodology element. Um, I talked about the intersectional purism because there's the issue of, uh, I've been at the end of criticisms uh, myself uh, with work that I've published about this issue of like, this is not pure intersectionality. And it's true that it isn't, um, but at the same time, we claim that intersectionality has the beauty that we can craft the analysis and that we can methodologically, the sky is the limit with this one. And one of the issues is that in a way, the starting point of intersectionality has been historically gender, race, and class. But on the other hand, we need to think about the extent to which in the field in which we operate, there needs to be more space to develop an, uh, or to accept ontologies that are different in terms of how we articulate intersectional categories. Some work that has been published, um, and I'm remembering uh, Martina Schliva's work and, and Mariana Johansson's work in particular about this issue of language and fluency. But those are not, protected characteristics. And so they remain pretty much at the level of discussion between academics. Having said that, I think they're fundamental to explain a lot of the inequality that are faced by individuals who come from different countries to work in another. And so things such as the extent to which we are able to be accepting of not, not the fact that there are limitless categories, but the fact that we in this discipline need to think about categories more broadly. 
I think is fundamental. And we haven't made a case for that. Hence why we find that in some cases, people focus on gender and are particularly attached to it. Um, and in some cases find it difficult to talk about race because of the taboo linked to it. And other categories emerge that others may not understand, but are situated also in context, but were not defined as part of the theory initially. Then there's the issue of the lack of an intersectional methodology. I think it is the case that you get the question, if you've done intersectional work and you've presented it, people say, what's the difference between what you're doing and using Joan Acker's inequality regimes? I have asked that question to people just to see what they answer because I think it's an interesting question methodologically that we need to reflect upon. What makes intersectional work, the way in which we see it published or the way in which we see it discussed, different from other frameworks that are available? And we cannot say that, for example, Acker was not interested in, in gender, race, and class. We can, we can criticize other things about her work, but we have to say that it was relevant in bridging the gap between sociology and organizations and business and management studies. Yet we have intersectionality as a corrective of all of these things that happened in the past. And so that is also one of my beefs with this. Then there's the issue of practice. And I, uh, I think there are two things that are, are relevant here. Uh, on the one hand, I think the pedagogic element of how do we teach intersectionality and whether we should. Are we imposing a framework to unsuspecting punters, basically? Or are we actually giving punters a reality check? And I think there's a responsibility that we have, particularly if we are in education, to bring an intersectional uh, lens to our discussions. The question is how do we do that intersectionally? Not just telling people about intersectionals, but actually so they understand their own role. And is this notion, how do you speak to people about the fact that they might in fact be part of the problem? And that is one of the issues in terms of how we address some of these discussions in terms of practice that intersectionality comes across as a corrective. So it might be that individuals don't necessarily respond to it positively because they might perceive that they are part of a problem. And that, there are other issues associated with this, the notion of allyship, the notion of um, in, how, how do we navigate, especially with those who are not experts in intersectionality, but are ex we are exposing them to this as a framework. Then there's the issue of organizations. And I think um, there are, there's in particular, uh, for me, the question of whether there is such thing as an organizational intervention, as an intersectional intervention. Um, and I think the extent to which we can take intersectionality and use it, for example, for organizational change remains an important challenge. A lot of the work that we do in any aspect of business and management looks to actually address something in an organization, either if it is solve a problem for workers, solve a problem for businesses themselves, solve a problem for managers. There's always like a problem solving approach. And because of that, we need to think about the extent to which the practice in itself needs to translate into something that can be used by others, not just as a theoretical or as an analytical tool. And I think academics in particular have not engaged with that. I know that Angela mentioned some of the work that actually some of us have done with Angela and the extent to which that has that type of work has been rolled out in our field is very limited. We would argue, and by say we, because we have argued that with Angela and other colleagues, that at this point in time, academic activism in business and management is catching up and is becoming trendy. We are celebrating almost 30 years of intersectionality. So what does that say about where we are? I will leave it at that because I just wanted to provide a roundup. I'm happy to take any questions or any comments. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Lots of things to think about and kind of reassess our position as well as, you know, how do we take this forward? As you said, we have been talking about this for a long time. <laughs>
there, are, there have been quite a few questions that have been submitted. I know that uh, some of us um, might not be available to stay over time. We're already past one, one hour, one o'clock. Um, we know what I wanted to say and remind that Nicola, for instance, left a message to say that Angela and Jenny, you are speaking at the is <laughs> yes. gender think space uh, next week on 15th, 16th in Newcastle. It will be really, really good. It's important to remind people we're not stopping at this point at this at the end of the webinar and getting back to our lives. But we'll continue the debate and continue to develop the theory further. There have been a couple of questions from John Kitching. Uh, kind of developing, you know, kind of understand, understanding, can intersectionality, for instance, capture the capacity of people positioned differently to exercise individual collective agency to challenge disadvantage? Or does it really focus only on explaining the forces that create and sustain the positioning within social hierarchies? Mm -hmm. um, big questions, big questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. John's question is what is going to be my next paper. Thank you, John, for that one. <laughs> um, I think that, yes, I think so. I think exploitative relationships structurally can be looked at using an intersectional lens. And one of the things that I didn't mention, probably I should have stressed, is that one of the problems with a lot of the discussion is that it remains at the level of the subjectivity. And I know that that might sound like a go at Jennifer's work, it's mm -hmm. not. But I do think that we need to think more broadly about within a capitalist system, what are the structures that are creating and perpetuating inequality? Where labor markets play a role, where firms play a role. This idea that we focus on individuals forces individuals to make a case for themselves in terms of, oh, this is, I feel oppressed is this idea of having to demonstrate that there is oppression that is affecting them. Whereas a more, I would say, comprehensive use of intersectionality would mean developing a framework where we are actually able to venture into looking at what are the structural elements. And I think that um, that has to do with colonial history. The, clearly, we need to understand in particular that most of these multinationals, when they establish subsidiaries, they go where to places where they know, where they have history. And so the intersectional power there in terms of, you know, how, how oppression and disadvantage counter, or not counter, but in, interact with privilege and power is rooted particularly in colonial history. So I do think that there's a space to use intersectionality to do that. I, don't necessarily think that we are not doing it, we're just not focusing that much on it. I think we're take, we, in the baby step scales, we're taking steps like at the level one or two. Jenny, one more question to you from Ito, and specifically seeking further elaboration on the, the term that you've introduced during your presentation around the ontology of intersecting categories. Can you explain uh, this a little bit more, if you don't mind? Well, the idea is that we need to understand that this idea of understanding what categories are and allowing for the space that we don't necessarily have to use existing categories and that we need to position ourselves within a discipline or within, when I say our discipline, or within any discipline within the field of business management and be able to understand that there are categories that need to be brought forward in order to understand how disadvantage works. In some cases, Think about the following. If you go to a country where the majority of the population is black, you're, the question of whether race is the primary category for disadvantage might, might overlook, it might be, I'm not gonna say that it's not relevant, but it might overlook other categories that individuals themselves construct. And I think is that is allowing that as a legitimate form of category construction. And One as you of, yes societies, different um, frameworks are, are more useful. So in countries that you're talking about, maybe shadism or colorism yeah. is more relevant. Maybe casteism is more relevant, depending on that society. So one thing that we cannot do, we have to be careful of doing, is parachuting our ideas from here to other yeah. settings. Um, and I think uh, Regina had a question, something about, uh, I didn't get to read it in depth, but it's about Brazil. I think it's, we have to be careful that the categories that we're using are relevant or applicable and they come from the societies that you're that you're looking at mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think Regina's question is around, you know, oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, just on that note on um, the, the categories, for example, um, I interviewed two people from Nigeria, for example, and the, exactly what you said, Jenny, so in Nigeria, race isn't the problem and it's, it's more considering the other categories or as Andrew said, it might be colorism, chasism, so that's really important to make sure it's always relevant. And um, yeah, so not just sort of trying to ask the same people. Yeah. I think, well, Rob, I suggest we, um, we're close at this point because I think we've, you know, we've, we've done an incredible webinar, lots of insights, lots of you know, thought-provoking ideas and questions, reflections. There has been a lot of input from the you know, participants as well. We will document all of the questions that have been asked. If we have missed anything, we'll try to answer it as a panel. And there will be a recording of this webinar available through the website, which is really exciting. And it's fantastic. So thank you so much for all of the participants. Thank you so much for our incredible panel. And thank you so much to Rob for organizing us all in this one place. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And right. next, you can catch us on Twitter, uh, is we dead? And we'll use the, use a hashtag to follow along with our our upcoming passing. Thanks. Yes, and I've also shared the link to next week's Think Space as well, so uh, you can book your space, you're still fine. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>